And so today's featured speaker is Dr. Ephraim Hanks. He's an associate professor of statistics here um, in the Eberly College of Science. And he's a statistician with a specialty in methods for spatial and spatial temporal data. His research focuses on advances in statistical modeling and computation to increase our ability to ask and answer scientific questions in ecology, epidemiology, and other fields. His work is motivated by collaborations with ecologists and epidemiologists. And so today, Professor Hanks' lecture is titled Understanding Wildlife Connectivity and Disease Spread Through GPS Tracking. And so, Dr. Hanks, thank you so much for being here today. We'll turn it over to you for your talk. Thank you. It, is the mic working? Can you guys hear me? OK, I, I, I see some thumbs up in the back. So we're in good shape. Well, thank you for coming, and thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of this. As was said, I'm a statistician. We're going to be talking about um, a lot of things that, that will look a lot like ecology and epidemiology. And just so we're clear, I'm a statistician, and so we're going to talk also some about the modeling. And I won't ask how many of you love calculus and differential equations, but I, I hope maybe you'll learn just a thing or two about that before we, before we leave today. So um, I, I, I'd be remiss if I started without thanking a few people. In fact, one of them is in the audience. Danushi, raise your hand. Everyone say hi, Danushi. Danushi's one of, uh, so, so no, no science is done by an individual, and especially at a university, the real work is done by the students. And Danushi is one of a, a half dozen students who have had a hand in some of the work I'm gonna show today. So um, uh, Danushi and, and many others, and then some uh, uh, faculty collaborators as well. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? I want to give you some idea about what's possible in, in tracking animals in this day and age. I'll show you GPS data, but also some other tracking as well. And then we're going to spend a good chunk of time talking about modeling. And um, that's, that's a lot of what I do, is try to take our intuition on a scientific um, uh, or other situation and try to transform that into a mathematical or statistical language. And then uh, I'll do two examples of using this kind of approach of modeling to um, pairing that with movement data to help us understand and predict things we couldn't do without the movement data itself. So I think we're all familiar with GPS data. If we all pulled out our phones, they're tracking us as we speak, very likely. And, um, and for, for a couple of decades, tracking of animals, remote tracking of animals, has been one of the major ways we collect data to understand animal behavior. So for large mammals, we can put collars on them, and we'll see some collared um, elk data later on. Uh, smaller birds, um, or smaller animals like birds, recently have been able to be tracked as well. There are backpacks that can fit on even small songbirds. You'll see that this one has a uh, solar cell there. And so with these advances in technology, with a solar cell, battery life is no longer as big of an issue. And we can get amazingly high resolution data for a long, long period of time. And I'll show you that in just a second. Now, in case you're wondering, you can also track your pooch or your, or, or your cat if you want. You can buy a little tracker. You can track it on your phone. So, uh, so you can get your own animal movement data if you want, if you want to see where your cat goes after dark. <laughs> so, um, if, uh, uh, so I'm going to show you a bunch of animal tracking data. And I, I just want you to know that it, if, you, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you can get online and you can download a lot of this kind of data. So there's a nice website called movebank.org, and each of these little dots is a different study. And every year there are hundreds, if not thousands, of new animal tracking studies that are conducted across the globe. And many of them are uploaded to MoveBank or other sites, and many of them are actually freely available. And so if I clicked on one of these dots, for example, I might get this tracking data on 1,000 different cranes that all have um, GPS trackers on them, and you can see them flying through the Middle East here. Each of these dots is a location for one crane over time. So many, much of this is freely available, freely viewable, and, and, and you, can, uh, you, you can grab this if you want to take a look at it later. So what, what does this tracking data look like? So what I'm going to show you here is um, tracking data. Let's, there we go. So each color here is a different migratory bird species. And this is all data from MoveBank. And this video was, was made by MoveBank, not by me. And you can see um, th this is what tracking data look like. We have bunches of individuals. Each of these colors is essentially a different study. So, you, so if you imagine just having one of these, this might tell you something in particular about that, that, um, 
uh, species. For example, if you look at this purple one that's moving up the middle, we can see its migratory flyways. We're now into the summer season and they're in their summer ranges. And as the weather turns colder, we'll see all of these migratory bird species migrate back south. And so you can imagine that this, this kind of tracking data provides information we could never get through human observation alone. Some of these tracks over the ocean, some of these tracks through um, uninhabited parts of our continent. So we can get all this because of the ability to remotely track animals. And this tells us a lot about where they are at different times of the year when we can't observe them easily on our own. So what do we get from telemetry data? We get tracks from individual animals. This gives us fine scale information about their movement choices, and that tells us a lot about the ecology of an animal. Uh, and as I said, this is data that are uh, collected remotely, places we can't follow. However, we, we don't get everything we might want out of telemetry data, out of this GPS data. So there's some things, in particular, um, we don't get an understanding about how the entire population behaves in most cases. Because most of the time studies are conducted on only a small group of animals. There's not the ability to tag every bird in the, in the, um, you know, on the continent. But we can, we can do a, a study and tag a few of them. So one of the themes of today is we're going to see um, the pairing of individual tracking data uh, and the additional information that's going to give us to, uh, to help us understand population level processes that we couldn't study fully without the individual data. So what are some of the things I want to, I, I want to share with you today? So uh, as I just said, this telemetry data, this tracking data, gives us information that are missing from other population level data. And then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about modeling. Um, not so much the statistical part, perhaps, but, but more of the mathematical modeling, the quantifying of our intuition. And then once we pair that with the GPS data and fit those models to data, that's going to give us some additional understanding. So that's what we're looking at today. So what is a model? A statistical or mathematical model is an attempt to quantify our intuition or understanding of a system. We take that intuition and we try to put it into exact quantitative mathematical terms. So a good model does a lot of things. It, it might capture important features of the data. It's going to allow us to answer the questions that we're after. Uh, it matches the data well. And all of that might require a fairly complicated model. On the flip side of that, we also want a model that uh, is numerically or analytically tractable. Because we've got to be able to actually fit this model to data. And often those things are at, at odds with each other. And we're not really going to explore that today. We're not going to explore the model fitting side. But I just want you to recognize that that is there. And it's a major part of what I and other quantitative scientists do. We try to build models that are useful but also tractable. So we, we just saw this movement data. And what I want to do next is um, build a general model for movement data like this, and also general enough to handle a lot of other types of behaviors as well. And I would argue that, um, it, so th this is what's been, what I've developed together with um, uh, students and some uh, other faculty at other universities over the past decade. Essentially, I think we can, we can boil down most movement behavior into four processes. So if we can build a model that captures these four things, we can do a lot with it. So we have some sort of directional bias. We see birds moving north and then they move south. They have a clear direction they're trying to go. So we want to model that. Sometimes the birds are moving fast, other times they're moving slow. So if we can build a model that can do directional bias and also fast versus slow movement, that would capture a lot. We also need directional persistence. And so what I mean by that is that that once a bird or another animal is moving in one direction, they tend to keep moving in that direction. Even if there's something, you know, they, they, they may, may tend to kind of curve slowly instead of make very jerky movements. Uh, and then finally, there is individual variation. Different birds move differently. So we're going to model these four things. We're going to do this. We're going to borrow some ideas from uh, physicists and mathematicians. We'll go straight back to Sir Isaac Newton. We all know Newton's second law. Uh, in a mathematical form, it's F equals MA. The force that acts on something is proportional, or is a, the product of the individual's mass and their acceleration. And so there, there's a couple things I want you to remember here. One is that uh, force is essentially proportional to acceleration. And uh, you, can, you, you can see that by thinking about how you feel when you're driving in a car. When you're driving in a car, you, um, let's say you're driving at a constant speed. If you're driving at 20 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour, 
or even if you're in an airplane going hundreds of miles an hour, if you're going at a constant speed, you may not notice that you're, you're moving at all. Or you may not be able to tell whether you're moving at 20 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour. But as soon as that car makes a sharp turn, you feel the force, you feel the car pushing. Or when that airplane takes off, you feel that acceleration as it pushes on you. So acceleration and force are sort of equivalent to each other. And so if we can model force, it's the same as modeling acceleration on an animal. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to build a model that models forces pushing on animals. So uh, to do that, we're going to use a bit of calculus here. So the data that we've seen are positions. We know where birds are. And so we're going to, um, so in mathematical terms, we often use an X to describe position. So those of you who are having flashbacks to, to, to bad classes in the past, it's going to be OK. We're, gonna, we're, we're all going to make it here together, right? This is going to be fine. So I, I want you to come away with a couple things about um, uh, derivatives and calculus. So derivatives and calculus are one of the major languages of mathematics and science. And um, while the, the analysis of them is, can be pretty complicated, the general ideas are very simple. So what does the derivative look like? It, we write it like this. There's always this d and then a d on the bottom. And so what this, this is just shorthand for saying this is change in this thing. So the change in position, which is x, and then the dt says change in position over time. So this is the change in position over time, and we call that velocity. So, so mathematically, what is a, um, uh, a, a, a derivative or calculus? What is the derivative? It's just a change in something over time. And the way to think about these is they're just kind of rates of change. So that's a, that's a pretty easy idea to think about modeling. We just want to model how something changes. So if we have position, here's a, here's a, uh, this is position on the x-axis. So we have an animal or something that starts at 0, and it goes in the positive direction and then back to the negative direction. Well, if we take the derivative of this, a derivative gives us a, a rate of change, which is essentially a slope. And so the slope here is positive. It's pointing up. And the slope here is negative. It's pointing down. And that's what's reflected over here in velocity. So velocity is the derivative of position. And so here, velocity is positive, which means we're going in the positive direction, positive slope. And then when we're going in the negative direction, we have a negative velocity. And acceleration is, in turn, the derivative of velocity. So acceleration is how velocity is changing. And in this case, we have a very simple acceleration. It starts positive, so there's force pushing this animal in the positive direction, and so it starts going that way. But soon, the force starts pushing in the negative direction, and that slowly changes its velocity and thus position and brings it back to 0. So, what do I hope you've gotten out of this? A brief reminder of what a derivative is. It's just a change. A brief reminder of what they look like if we plot them. A derivative is just a slope of a surface. We're going to need this later. And a, a link between position, which is where we get to observe data, and acceleration, which Sir Isaac Newton tells us is proportional to force acting on animals. So we're going to build a model for acceleration but we can link that back through these derivatives to the position, which is the data that we get to see. OK. So here's, you're still having flashbacks, but we're, we're still going to make it through it, right? So this is, this is all still going to be OK. So what do we have here? What I want to do is build up a model for uh, movement. And I'm going to write it out in quantitative terms. And don't get bogged down in the quantitative notation. But this is what a, a lot of quantitative scientists do. We take that intuition that I was talking about, those four ideas, and we're going to code these into a mathematical or statistical equation. So what do we have here? On the left, we have um, our second derivative of position. That's our acceleration. So we're modeling the acceleration or the force on an animal. And everything over here is going to be our model for that. And so we had a couple things we wanted to model. One of them was we wanted to model individual variation. And we're going to do that with this epsilon. This is, this is going to be a, a, a normal distribution. So random error. It's just going to allow for different animals at different times to do different things. So what about the rest of this? So let's take this one piece at a time. So I told you we wanted to model directional bias. Like animals like, or birds like to fly north in the summer and south in the winter. We're going to do that by, again, borrowing some ideas from physics. So we're going to construct a surface, which I'll call P, a potential surface. And we're going to take its derivative. If you remember, derivative is just a slope. So here's our surface. It looks like this. And if I dropped a ball anywhere on here, the ball would roll down towards the center. 
And so uh, in a derivative term, the, the, uh, the derivative of this surface, or the gradient, always points in either the up or down direction. So if I take this and I, and I calculate its derivative, its arrows like this pointing down toward the center. So what I have here is a force that essentially always pushes animals down towards that center. So you can imagine we could construct all sorts of different bumpy surfaces, and animals might behave kind of like a ball rolling in these bumpy surfaces. So let me show you a little bit of what that looks like. So here we have that same surface, and I'm going to show you some simulated. This is a simulated animal track moving in that surface. Wherever the animal is, it's always pushed back down towards that central location. And um, mathematically what's happening is wherever it is, the force is pushing uh, along the direction of the slope of this surface. So this is it. I'm going to call this a potential surface, and it controls directional bias. As you can see from this track, this might be a pretty good model for a central place forager animal. Maybe it has a den here where the red dot is and explores around to find food nearby. So we can capture some kinds of movement already. We can get this directional bias. Okay. Oops. There we go. Okay, so what else did we say we wanted to model? We wanted to model the, the ability to just go fast or slow at different places or different times of the year. All right, I'm going to do that with another surface. This will be a motility surface. I'll denote it by an M, and it factors into this model as well. So this controls fast or slow movement. I'm going to show you how this works, um, uh, again, through simulation. So what I have here is a potential surface. And through the rest of this talk, I'm going to show potential surfaces like this. Instead of in 3D space, we're going to see them as a colored surface, with lighter colors being low areas. So uh, if I release an animal here, it's going to slowly move down towards the, the white or the yellow from the red. So if I release this animal here, it's going to be moving this direction. And in this blue rectangle, I've put a region of low motility. So uh, we have high motility. Outside that, the animal moves pretty quickly. Once it reaches this uh, region of low motility, then it moves slower. It's still following that potential surface, still moving to the right but it does it slower, and once it leaves that region of low motility, it picks up speed again. So you can see that by combining this, these ideas of um, uh, fast and slow movement and directional bias in movement, we can capture a wide range of behavior. And so let's, let's do, um, uh, let me talk about one other thing first. So uh, the last thing I, I mentioned is some sort of directional persistence. And in all of the plots I've been showing so far, you see that these animals don't change direction very quickly. They maintain a bit of directional um, uh, persistence over time. And that's really controlled by this last parameter here, this beta. What's really happening is, here's the velocity of the animal. And this is, kind of the, this is the mean direction of movement under our model. And we have a model that says, whatever velocity I am, I'm going to find the difference between that and this mean movement. And the bigger beta is, the faster I'm going to change to be moving in that mean, towards that mean level of movement. So if beta is really, really large, we, we go straight to going down the potential surface. And if beta is smaller, then, we have a, then there's a lot more directional persistence. OK, so we have a model here that, that has all of the, that, that's a quantification of our intuition for those four ideas for how, that might control a lot of movement behavior. So let's do a more complicated example here. So we had this, um, I showed you this migratory bird movement. So let's see if I can take motility and potential surfaces and try to simulate movement that looks like this. So here we go. Um, what I'm going to do is break this up into four seasons. And uh, because our screens are wider to the right than they are up and down, I'm going to make movement go right and left instead of north and south. Okay. So in the winter, We'll, we'll assume that the wintering grounds for this bird are, are down here. And, uh, and so we have a potential surface which says, wherever I am, I'm going to be moving back down towards this white area. And my motility throughout this whole surface is yellow, which is going to be small motility. So in the winter, we're not moving very fast, and we're moving down here. In the spring migration, we're going to switch that potential surface to bring us up here. And so, um, and, and we're also going to raise the motility to be very high. So we're going to move very quickly in a, in a directed fashion up here. In summer, we'll lower the motility. So we'll move slower, but we'll stay 
in this summering range. And then finally, we'll flip things back around with the potential bringing us back down t towards our wintering range in a fall migration. So let me show you very briefly what this looks like. There's a simulated path in which an animal starts in one location, moves very quickly to another, stays there for a while, and moves back. So we see two, two quick years of simulated migratory bird. So what I hope I've convinced you of is that we can take the features that we see in data and we can construct a mathematical and statistical model that uh, you know, using, using a fairly simple framework that I could explain to you in five or 10 minutes, we can construct a wide range of varying behaviors. So that's, that's what we've done. This is the model. This is what I do as a, as a quantitative scientist. I try to quantify that intuition and then what do we do? We're going to take data and we're going to try to estimate the pieces of this model, the beta, the potential surface, the motility surface. So far I've been simulating, which means I've specified those. And for the rest of the talk, we're going to be looking at actual data and trying to estimate them and use our estimates of those to help us understand uh, better the science surrounding, um, the, the, the surrounding the species that we're studying. OK, so I'm going to give you two examples. The first is an example of ant movement. And um, I, I, I'm going to give a shout out. I saw David in the back. Hi, David. David Hughes is back here. And so this is joint work with the David Hughes Lab. And I'm going to give a couple shout outs to them today. So we're going to talk about some movement that was conducted in a lab uh, just right over there, about 100 yards away from us, on Campanatus pennsylvanicus ants. These are just small black ants, carpenter ants. They live in wood, collected in the, in the forests around here. Um, just a side note, this is not what we're talking about, but I felt I had to give a shout out to, to David's system because we can say the word zombie ant and, and mean it. And so, um, so if you don't know about this system, you should just go home and Google that. Um, uh, so you can Google this. You can also, unfortunately not today, but on the weekdays, if you walk over to the building over here, which is the Millennium Science Complex, I think it's called that because the front looks like the Millennium Falcon a little bit. So this weird building over here, right inside the lobby, there's a beautiful exhibit with some iPads um, that can walk you through a lot of the science surrounding this system. But, but very briefly, there's a fungus, the Ophiocordyceps fungus, that will infect an ant. Over time, it will, it will um, uh, spread all throughout the ant's body, taking up most of their body mass by the time the ant finally dies. It makes the ant latch onto the underside of a leaf and latch so hard it just stays there until it dies. And then after it dies, if that wasn't enough, the fungus shoots a stalk out of its brain, out of its head, and out of that stalk come more spores, and that's how uh, the, those are picked up by other ants, and that is the life cycle of the Ophiocordyceps. So a pretty cool system. If you want to know more, just go uh, Google zombie ants. You, you'll get all the good stuff, and you'll see David Hughes, that man sitting over there. But we're not going to talk about that today. Isn't that a letdown now? I, I hope it's not so much of a letdown. OK, so what are we going to talk about? So I told you earlier, um, a lot of what we can get out of individual tracking data is it, is it can provide some in information that we can't get um, from population level data, or that helps explain population level processes. And so the process I'm going to talk about here is what's called trophallaxis. And trophallaxis is um, what we're seeing right here. You can see two ants and their, their mandibles are coming together here. And so what happens is that ants will, will share fluids mouth to mouth. And why do they do this? So um, ants, especially important ants like the queen ant, um, spend most of their lifetime inside of a nest. And so the ants that you see out on the ground, there's only a small percentage of ants in the nest actually ever leave that nest and come out and forage. And you know, queens can live for decades in, you know, in, inside their nest and only leave very, very rarely. So, you know, if you send your grandkids out to play in the backyard, there might be an ant in the backyard that's older than your grandkids. It's possible, one of these queen ants. So how does that ant survive if it never leaves? All of the food, all the water, all the nutrients are outside the nest in that dangerous environment where we can step on them or spray them or something. So a small number of ants go out as foragers. They collect food. They bring it back in in those nice long trails we all see. And then they share it through the colony mouth to mouth through this trophallaxis. So the ant colony essentially has a shared stomach, and they, and, and they share it mouth to mouth. 
So as you can imagine, these mouth-to-mouth -mouth interactions, this trophallaxis, is really important for maintaining uh, the health of the colony. So here's an experiment that was conducted by the Hughes lab just over here um, a few years back. The experiment is about um, what happens to societies when they're put in different densities. And this is, this is important right now, right? We, you know, we, all, we all hear about coronavirus, and it's flu season right now, and we've all come together in this room where we're all nice, packed, closely together, and nothing bad could ever come of that, right? We all know that. Um, so, so, so this is an experiment on a system that we can manipulate. We can't manipulate humans, but we can manipulate ants. And they live in social societies like we do. So here's the experiment. So at the, at the beginning of the experiment, um, 80 ants, I guess we had 78 by the end, were put in a small nest like this. You can see they're kind of packed all together, but ants don't mind. They, they, they like living tight like that. Uh, there's an entrance here that leads out of the nest, and they have all the food and water that they need. And so after being accustomed to this high-density environment where they're all kind of on top of each other, their nest was expanded. So you can see this one box here. It was expanded to a second, third, fourth box. And so now all of a sudden the ants have a much larger space to live in. And you can see that this colony, what they did is they kind of split apart with a little over half of the ants mostly staying in this box while uh, a little less than half come over here. And so we have ants, the same ants, living in a high density and then a low density environment, being packed tight together and then spread further apart. And one of the major questions of interest is how does this affect the population connectivity? How does this affect, for example, that trophallaxis sharing? We might, for example, um, think that this trophallaxis might be more common when ants are close together than when they're far apart, or when, when they're in a, in a lower density uh, environment. And we would hope similar things would happen with, say, the passing of the flu virus or, or the corona coronavirus or something. When we're packed tightly together, it's very easy for diseases like that to pass, right? However, in this case, for this colony, something interesting happened. In fact, so what, if, if what we have here is time, four hours in seconds. And on the left, we have the cumulative number of trophallaxis events observed. And what we see is that um, in this low density environment in blue, they actually had more trophallaxis events. And this was actually replicated in three colonies. And um, in none of those colonies were there fewer trophallaxis events in the lower density environment. So somehow the ants have maintained population connectivity even though they've been put in a, in a, um, uh, you know, in a lower density environment. So I guess the pessimist would say if ants were susceptible to coronavirus, it wouldn't matter if they were in high density or low density, they're going to pass it around just the same. So how do they do that? How do they maintain that connectivity? So that's what, that's what we're going to use movement data to explain here. OK, before I um, do that, I want to show you the data that we have. So we didn't stick GPS trackers on the ants. We're not there yet. They're too, they're, they're, they're too small. But uh, the Hughes Lab did have a very nice setup. They have GoPro cameras watching these ants. And so we have video like this where we can see all of the ants. And over the course of about a year, 17 undergraduates clicked on every ant in every every time point. And each ant has this unique identifier on their back, so we know which ant was which. The purple bars that are popping up are trophallaxis events that were identified from this video information. And so uh, on the backs of these 17 undergraduates, we, this, this amazing uh, data set of movement data for ants was created over the course of about a year. So by the end, we have data on 80 ants collected over this whole nest on, at one second intervals um, for four hours. So you can see here some movement data for these ants. And uh, you can see pretty clearly, if you watch this, why it's not a real surprise that the number of trophallaxis events did not decrease. Even though the, the ants have spread themselves out, with some being over here and some being over here, you'll note that uh, when ants decide they want to move back and forth, they can do it very, very quickly. It only takes a couple of seconds for them to go back and forth. And so even though um, you know, we can look and say that these ants are spread out in space, functionally the movement connects them very, very quickly. So what I want to do here is, um, uh, is try to explain that as best we can using the model that I just described, the mathematical statistical model for ant movement. So what are some of the key features we saw in that data? 
We see the ants moving very, very quickly in the middle of the nest. We saw them changing directions very quickly in the middle of the nest. On the sides of the nest, they weren't moving nearly as fast, moving a little bit slower. So you can see how we might get a potential surface allowing us to change directions and a motility surface from this kind of data. So what are we going to do? We're going to model these as just smooth functions in space, our potential function and our motility function. And we're going to estimate these from the data. So in the first of my talk, I was simulating. I specified those and simulated data. Now we're going backwards. What we have is real data. And we're hoping that this model is a reasonable fit. And so we're going to take that data and find the potential motility surfaces that best explain the movement data that we just observed. So here's what that looks, looks like. So the estimated motility surface is shown right here for this colony. And you can see that uh, the color scale again is that yellow is low and, um, and, and darker colors are high. So we see that in the middle of the nest we have very high motility. So when ants are here, they're going to move fast. And when they're on the sides, they move a lot slower. So that, that, that captures what our intuition was when we, when we looked at the data and explains a lot of why ants are able to maintain connectivity in these two fairly distant spatial locations. The potential surface I'm showing here in 3D because I think it looks pretty cool that way. And, um, and, and so what, is this, what does this capture? I want you to think about what a ball would do if it were rolling around here. There's very little to kind of um, uh, change its direction here. But as soon as this ball or this ant decides to move into one of these middle corridors, what happens? It's almost like um, the, 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 the sort of half pipe in the Olympic snowboarding, right? You can see this happening, right? So they come here and um, they're at the top of a hill and they build up speed down in this valley and come up here and there's this huge ridge bowl that turns them stops their, their, their forward momentum and pushes them back down this hill, up another hill, down a valley, up another hill, down a valley, slaloming all the way to the other side of the nest. So what do we have? We have a, a mathematical estimation, a statistical estimation of, a, um, a, of how ants move. And uh, we're representing that through these potential motility surfaces. But what this does is capture the, the movement that we've seen. They move fast in the middle of the nest, and they make these turns at very, very fast speeds so they can move quickly from one side of the nest to the other. And putting these together, the, the, this, this movement data explains that connectivity. Understanding what happened here and seeing, you know, so this movement data is what allowed us to estimate these surfaces. And these surfaces themselves explain very well why we don't see any real decrease in, um, uh, in connectivity in this population. So that, that's my first example. So I want you to see, that what have we done? We've taken individual tracking data, and that helps us explain population level behavior that maybe wasn't immediately clear from the outset. We're going to do that again in a second example. This example is perhaps a little bit more involved. We get to, again, see some differential equations. I know you've been waiting for that. I know you weren't, I know you weren't done there. So we're going we're gonna to talk about a study of elk in the greater Yellowstone area. So th this is an elk, of course. This is the Yellowstone National Park. We have Wyoming, Montana, Idaho here, Grand Teton National Park, and the Wind River Ranges down here. And there's elk all throughout this area. And there's also a lot of cattle ranching in this area. And today we're going to talk about a, um, uh, so a study of elk for the express purpose of understanding a disease called brucellosis or brucella abortus. And so what does this disease do? This, it infects bovines like elk, cattle, and bison. And it, as the name implies, it, um, uh, it induces abortions in females, you know, in, in pregnant females. And so this can be devastating to cattle herds if a, a, you know, a, a cow and a cattle herd gets infected with brucellosis, essentially the whole herd has to be slaughtered. And you know, they, they can't sell the meat from cows infected with brucellosis. And uh, you know, they're not going to have healthy young. And so, so, so you can imagine the, the cattle ranchers in this area are very concerned with the potential spread of this disease anywhere. So the transmission of this disease actually can only happen through direct transmission. The, um, uh, the pathogen, the, the brucella abortus, can't live in the open air for very long. 
And so the only way it's passed is when a cow has an abortion and then other cows are coming by and they don't really like try to eat the aborted fetus, but they may be um, munching the grass nearby. You can see this one's pulling at a bit of an afterbirth there. So, so all the transmission happens essentially through these um, abortion events. And these only happen, so those abortion events only happen in the, um, in the spring or late winter, which is right before um, animals would typically be having babies, right, in the spring. So how do, how do we have surveillance data on this disease? So we actually get it mostly from hunters who help us out. Now this actually is a Pennsylvania elk, just so you know. We're not, this, I just saw this and I thought we'd put this in since we're in Pennsylvania. So this is a local elk taken uh, here. But most of our, um, in, in the greater Yellowstone area, most of the disease surveillance data we have come from blood samples from hunter-killed elk. So hunters will be given a, a little kit to collect some blood samples, or there will be scientists stationed during hunting season at the bottoms of canyons, and when uh, hunters come out with elk, they'll, 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 they'll request a very small sample of blood or, or tissue. And from that, they can test whether or not these elk had, um, uh, had the disease, brucellosis, or not. There's also a few uh, uh, winter surveys, but most of our data comes from the fall. Now, I just told you that the transmission happens in the spring. And so now let's take a look at what elk, um, what elk movement looks like. And you can see that they are in very different locations in the spring and the fall. So th this, this plot started in the, in the winter. And so you can see the, uh, the winter range of this elk is over here. It's spending its summer at the slightly higher elevation. Green is high elevation here. And then once it turns winter again, it's going to move back over to its winter range and eventually return almost to where it was a year ago today. So point is this, fall locations for elk are very different than spring locations. And so our surveillance data happens in the fall, um, uh, but our uh, transmission of the disease happens in the spring or the late winter. And so fortunately, uh, GPS data are going to be enough to help us bridge that gap. So what I want to show you here is the data we have. And there are two sources of data. And the first of them, you can start to see here. Each of these polygons is a management unit. So um, each state has their own management units. Divide, they divide up their whole state. And uh, our seroprevalence data, the disease data, are only available to that resolution. We don't know exactly where the, the elk was, but we know which polygon it was in. So the coloring here, every time there's a colored polygon, it means we have some disease data. And the darker the color, the more of those animals had that disease. So this is going to be kind of a jumpy plot. And I want you to notice a couple of things. One, there's going to be pulses of the, this color. And those pulses are happening in the fall when, uh, when we have a lot of surveillance data. But note that the, the it's hard to see a, a clear pattern in this plot. Okay, so you can, what we're seeing here is monthly or weekly data. So you can see these pulses happening in the fall. Uh, over time, you, you're starting to see some blue dots. So these blue dots are different GPS um, collared elk surveys that have happened across this range. And you can see a couple things. One, you can see clear patterns in their movement. They sort of pulse out in the summer and c compress back in the winter. And you can also see that we only have GPS data in a few locations. We don't have it throughout the whole range. So it's not like the ants where we had data everywhere where there might be elk. So I should note that this is sort of an amazing amount of data. This is two decades worth of data collection, thousands of seroprevalence tests, millions of GPS locations. Um, and uh, so, putting that all together, what is our goal? What I want to do today is show you how we can take this data and provide a map that uh, shows us in a lot clearer detail where this disease might have spread from and where it might be going in the future. And that's kind of hard to tell from the seroprevalence data, these flashes of color here. So at the end of today, we're going to do a much prettier plot of this, and that's what it's all about. Okay, so let me um, uh, men you know, re-mention a couple things I've just said. One is that elk uh, move differently across the year. So um, in the winter, they have very defined winter ranges. In the summer, they spread out and move to different regions. And, and then 
they're pretty site faithful and return back to their winter ranges fairly well. So what are we going to do? We want to use this movement data to reconcile the asynchrony in our data collection. The GPS tracking data is localized in space, but it's highly precise. The seroprevalence data is available at some level over the whole spatial domain, but is very patchy in time. So if we pair these together, we, we can glue them together and, and get something that's more than the sum of their parts. So we're going to use this GPS data to estimate elk movement using the model I've talked about, or a similar model to what I've talked about so far. And then we're going to integrate that resulting movement estimate into a spatial model for disease spread. So first I want to show you how we're going to model the disease spread. So each of these uh, management units, so when there's color it means I have some, um, uh, some test data on elk for that polygon at that time. And so we'll call that Y. So Y is the number of samples that were tested positive for the disease, and N is the number of sam blood samples that we had total. And so this model, a binomial model, is a model for coin flips. So if I have N coin flips, and the probability of getting a heads or getting brucellosis is, um, is this value here, I over N, then th this is the right model for that. So the same intuition for coin flips um, uh, works here. So what are I and N? I is the number of infected individuals in that polygon, maybe this yellow one, and N is the total number of elk in that polygon. Uh, another, another term I'll use is S. So if I is the number of infecteds, then S is the number of susceptible elk, so the elk that are not infected. And if I add those up, I get N. So we may go back and forth between S's and N's here. So what do I have here? I have a model that says, OK, if I get these tests, and some of them say the elk had yet, uh, the disease, yes, and some say no, this is a reasonable model for that. And it's all based on uh, some understanding of how many infected elk there are and how many total elk there are in every polygon across time. So we don't know that, but the, the, the GPS data are going to help us get that. OK, so here's our model. As I said, if you, if you were worried when we were going to see more differential equations, here you go. We got them. We're, we're back. So what are we doing here? Here's our derivative. So we're going to model the change in susceptibles. Or equivalently, we're going to model the change in infecteds at one location. And so we're going to start out by focusing on one polygon. And I've drawn this funny shape to be a polygon. And so this piece here in yellow essentially says, well, this is modeling the rate at which um, susceptible elk, elk that are not infected, become infected. And it's kind of fancy, but what is there? There's a parameter beta, and then it says, OK, how many susceptibles do we have? So the more susceptibles we have, the, more, the higher the rate will be at which they, they become infected. So beta here is the rate at which each of these susceptibles meets another elk. And then i over n is the probability that that elk that they just met was infected. So, so this here is just a way for saying we have some, some sort of density-dependent transmission. And when lots of elk are close together, we're going to have higher transmission. This beta, we can allow this to change over time. So for example, we could make that only allow for transmission in the spring, when abortions can happen, and have it be zero at any other time. OK, so this is just a mathematical model for how a susceptible elk can become infected. Now over time, an infected elk can shed their infection. And this next piece here, delta, is just a rate at which they shed their infection. So after they've been infected, after a few years, they may no longer have the disease. So this is just a rate for how uh, infected elk return to being susceptible or uninfected. So that leaves us with this blue piece. And so far, we've been talking only about one polygon. So this is all happening within a management unit, within a small spatial region. But elk, as we've seen, can move pretty far across this, the, the, the Yellowstone area. And so this last piece is just a rate at which individuals move between locations. So one of these terms tells us about all the elk who are leaving a polygon. And the other term, so that, this is the one where all the elk are leaving. And then this is the one where all the elk are coming in. And these are parameterized by alphas. So the alphas are the rates at which elk move between polygons. So if I have one polygon here and another one there, my model says that my infected elk move from here to here at rate alpha ml. And the, the uninfected elk move at the same rate. 
And this is pretty reasonable for this disease because brucellosis doesn't really affect the, the animal's health except for the potential for abortions in females. And we have, a, we have a different rate for moving back. So it's possible to have asymmetric rates of movement here. So what do we have? We have a model for disease spread that's a spatial model. It allows for sort of transmission within a polygon and then allows for elk that are infected or not to move between polygons. And so what we're going to do is use the GPS data to estimate these alphas and then use that to, together with the, um, the, the disease test data to uh, to estimate and, uh, and predict what these infected and ends are going to be across the whole region. So what are some things we need? OK, so we have the GPS data in some locations, but we don't have them in others. So we need a, a model for movement that, um, that can somehow predict movement where I have no data. And maybe that's a really bad idea, but sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do. So we're going to show you how we'll do that. How, how are we going to do that? We're going to model our potential and motility surfaces as a function of the landscape. So the background here, the, the, the grayscale, is elevation. And elevation is a pr pretty good driver of a lot of elk movement and a lot of animals. So, um, so what we're going to do is our motility and potential surfaces, we're going to model as a function of elevation or forest cover or other predictor variables. And what we'll essentially do is the potential function, we'll just say, let's take our elevation and we're going to multiply it by a by a parameter beta, which we're going to estimate later on. So imagine if this was positive, then our potential surface looks like elevation, and so elk are going to go down elevation, downhill. If this is negative, if that beta is negative, then our potential function looks like upside down elevation, and so they're going to go towards the mountaintops instead of away from them. So a positive beta means we're going downhill, and a negative beta means we're going uphill. Or we can switch that, but, but you can see how um, we, we could model the, the propensity to move up or down or fast or slow in different terrain types. And if we did that, we could then predict movement everywhere. So we've used elevation. We're also using a bunch of other landscape covariates. I'm not going to talk a lot about them, but I wanted to show you all that went into this. So we have um, uh, DEM, which is our elevation. We can see here the, uh, the Yellowstone area, Grand Tetons right here. This is the uh, Wind River Range over here. And see that we also use things like ag percent agricultural land or forest land, road density, and other types of land cover. And all these are going to go into our motility and potential surfaces. And what I'm showing you here is the estimate from our GPS data of that beta term. So this is an estimate for the um, potential surface over here. This beta is estimated right here. On the x-axis, we have the time. So we have winter on the edges and summer in the middle. And you can see we have a big sort of flip-flop here. We have the same, we have a different sort of behavior here in motility. Let me try to explain this a little more cleanly by narrowing in on a couple locations in time. So if I look right here, this is during the spring migration. What do we have? We have a negative value for uh, this beta for elevation in our potential surface. So that means we're going to be moving towards higher elevation, like I was just explaining. Our motility in this case is positive, so that means the higher the elevation, the faster we're going to move. So, so this, this gives us some idea of what the movement pattern might be at that time of year. If I look at the winter, now my beta is in a completely different spot for the potential surface. It's positive, so that means my potential surface looks like elevation, and I'm going to be going downhill towards lower elevation valleys. And I, I also, at this point in time, have faster movement the higher elevation I am. So if I'm at a high elevation in the winter, I quickly move downhill. OK, so you could do the same sort of uh, estimation for all the other predictor variables. It gets a little hard to interpret each of these individually. But what I want to do is show you some predicted movement. So this is what we saw by looking at the data. We, we see a couple things. A major pattern is this. In the winter, animals are tightly clustered in mid or low elevation valleys. And in the summer, they spread out a lot. And what I'm going to show you here is a simulation of what a whole huge population of elk distributed across this, um, uh, across the, the, uh, um, the Yellowstone area. I'm going to show you what their movement looks like over the course of two years. And so right now, we're starting in the winter. And the definition you can see here, these, these darker areas, are where the elk are. And so these are actually the, the mid or low elevation valleys. 
And what you'll see is we start this video. Oops, sorry about that. So we'll see as the weeks go on, we move towards summer, this gets much more diffuse as elk are able to move back up into the high elevations and spread out across the whole region. As we move back to winter, everything gets much more defined again as they compress back down to their very tight winter ranges. In summer, they spread out again. And then finally in winter, they compress back to their winter ranges. So what have we done? We've taken that movement data and we've used that to estimate essentially movement patterns anywhere in this space. From those movement patterns, we can estimate the alphas, which are the movement rates between these different polygons. And that's what we needed for this model for spatial disease spread. So now we're going to take that model. We fit that model to the observed seroprevalence data that we had in these different polygons. And instead of that sort of flashy, hard to read um, a video I showed you at the first of this, I want to show you here our best predictions for where this disease, brucellosis, has been over the past, um, past decades in the greater Yellowstone area. So you can see we begin with most of the disease being centered down here in the, uh, south of Yellowstone. Um, and then over time, you can see it begins to spread. It jumps the Idaho border here, starts to spread up through Wyoming, and also jumps up into Montana. And you'll see that these three reaches um, are, are the, the, uh, the most uh, obvious spatial spread directions. We also see a little bit coming to the south. So what have we done here? We've taken that data that we had before that was patchy in space and time, and by pairing the movement data with the seroprevalence data, we can understand much better where the disease has been, and that gives us a lot of information about where it's going next. Up in uh, Wyoming this way, Montana this way, and Idaho this way. Okay, so um, uh, I, I'm running a little bit short on time, so let me just uh, skip through here. So what have we talked about today? So I started by um, showing you some GPS data and what animal tracking looks like. We've talked through models for animal movement data and then done two studies where movement data have helped explain and predict the future. So I want to remind you, you can go look at your own movement data. If you don't want to tag your dog, you can go look at somebody else's tag data on MoveBank. It's a good place. We've talked about models. I hope you're not as scared of differential equations. They're just rates or slopes. Uh, and, um, and, and we've built up a model that is pretty useful for a wide range of movement data. And this is what I do as a quantitative scientist. I try to build models that we can fit and use them to help us predict the future. These model terms, we can estimate them from data. So we've taken our ant data and used that to estimate the slalom that it helped explain how fast ants moved. And Doing that sort of estimation can help us understand population processes which we really couldn't understand without the movement data themselves. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hanks. Um, if you have questions, hold them up really high so that our students um, who are here for Science Lion Pride can come grab them from you and bring them down to me to ask. All right, yes, and keep them up until someone's, someone's come for it so that they can see it. Um, and so while we're waiting for these questions to be collected, um, I'll pose an initial question to Dr. Hanks. Um, you've been talking about two different projects that you did regarding animal tracking. They were both, both pretty different, used different methods, but in your work um, and you know, your exposure to animal tracking, what do you see as, as future opportunities for how animal tracking could be used or where animal tracking is going? Uh, so a couple of things. Um, so I've been at this for about a decade now and um, the, uh, you know, as, as everything, all technology right now is just getting smaller and faster and better. The same is true for these tracking technology. Um, you know, a decade ago, we couldn't put trackers on small songbirds. Um, so we've gone from being able to track large mammals down to small songbirds. And, you know, what's going to happen in a decade or two? We'd love to be able to track, you know, bumblebees, for example, honeybees. We'd love to be able to track um, uh, butterflies, monarch butterflies. Um, so, and, and I can see us getting to the point where we might be able to do that in a decade or two, uh, track even smaller animals. The, the, other, uh, the other place... Um, that I see a lot of technological advances is that um, 
these trackers are now able to record other information besides the location. Some of them can, can record things like elevation above sea level or have accelerometers in them like your phone. You know, your phone knows when you shake it. And some of these trackers do the same so they know when an animal is moving or they can even count how many steps it's taken, just like you have a step tracker in your phone. So all of that is information that we can use to better understand the ecology of the animals. Okay, and while you were on the topic of technological change impacting our ability to track different animals for different purposes, um, there's an audience member who is wondering about um, the role that drones might play, if any, um, in, in animal tracking and potentially helping further this, this research. So, um, so drones are, um, are becoming very useful for a lot of remote data collection. Um, but I, I want you to note that there's a real difference between the information we get from a tracker on an animal versus a drone. Just like there's a difference between having a tracker on an animal and people in this room going out and looking for birds or, or sighting other species. So a drone, we can tell the drone where to go and wherever the drone is, it can watch for animals there. In rare cases, you could perhaps have a drone follow an, an animal, but for the most part, a drone is going to capture what's happening in a location over time. And animal tracking data, when we stick a collar on an animal, we stick it on the, you know, the collar on an animal at one location and then the animal can go wherever it wants. So the tracking data, like the GPS data I've shown you here, is distinct from what we get from drones because it's going to follow an animal rather than being uh, focused on a location. So those, those give us two different kinds of information. Just like the disease data we're on, sort of spatial polygons, and the tracking data move wherever the animals want. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have a few questions related specifically to the elk study, so I'm going to try and address those here. Um, and so um, well, there's one audience member who's curious about um, whether your model to understand brucellosis transmission can be ex uh, extended to understand transmission from bison to cattle herds, whether it's been done and if there's any real world impacts of doing that research in terms of either protecting bison or protecting the cattle population? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, and so the short answer is we have not done anything with bison yet. Um, uh, we have a ton of um, uh, disease data on bison, but we don't, I don't have any movement data on bison. So uh, not having good movement data means I can't stitch things together well. So we know a lot about where the cattle are, um, or we can infer a lot about where the cattle are. We know a lot about the elk because of the two decades of collection. Um, and it would be important to, um, uh, it, it would help us to also know more about the bison, but we don't have that yet. So very good question. All right, and thank you so much. Um, I think to follow up to that, um, we have a few audience members who are wondering um, about how um, brucellosis and, and the research you've been doing might have been able to impact the success of, of herds um, or any, any, any of efforts to control the spread of this disease, what interventions can be done using this information, what can park management staff do using, using the kind of data and the models that you've created here? Yeah, this is a really good question. So let me give you the pessimistic view first. Most of the time when we model disease spread, there's very little we can do about it. And that's true for most diseases. You know, so we hear a lot about coronavirus and, right now, right? And there's a lot of efforts to, to uh, try to protect people. You know, the State Department has said, don't fly to China. That's going to help us some. But um, in many cases, um, infectious diseases spread faster than we can act on them. So in this case, the brucellosis case, um, it's kind of in a Goldilocks zone where the spread is slow enough that over the course of two decades, we were able to watch the spread. And in two decades, it didn't just you know, completely um, cover the entire, uh, the entire tri-state region that we, we've been showing here. So this is actually a case where um, th there is the possibility of some interactions. Uh, you know, some, some interventions that might slow the course of the disease. So we meet yearly about this, uh, um, people from the, the tri-state region, um, to talk about what might be done. And some of the actions that they've asked us to, um, to look into are what if they, for example, allowed for in certain regions where the disease might be spreading soon, what if they allowed hunters to kill a lot more elk? Depopulate the elk herds in that region for a few years. 
And that would keep the, the density of elk very low. And um, so what we, could, we, uh, what we could do is take this model and run it forward in time with the assumption that some of, you know, we, we could look at different scenarios. For example, in some scenarios, we might take a location up here in Montana and depopulate some of the elk herds. And so that would be lowering our N uh, value for the number of elk in that region. Um, and so those are some of the things we've talked about doing. At this point, what uh, our, our major focus is uh, still on getting a really good model fit to what we've seen so far, and but we're hoping within the next couple of years to be to be looking at some of these different scenarios and and trying to help guide the management actions of the people in these three states. Okay, and another follow-up question about the brucellosis: Does it have um, any known implications for human human disease? Is it able to be um, spread between? Um, the cattle and the um, bovines to humans, and if so, is there any mechanism that we know of where that might happen? I'm, I'm not aware of any um, uh, any uh, you know possibility of transmission to humans. Um, uh, that said, as I said before, you know brucellosis infected cattle cannot you know cannot be sold at market. So um, you know be because of the the the, the, the possibility of a um, uh, of a crossover event, but uh, but it's it, I don't know of any that have happened. Okay, wonderful. Um, and so there's a general, more broader question about um, your experience with um, animal tracking studies. Um, have you noticed any significant changes in the patterns of how any species of animals that you've been tracking have been moving um, because of broad changes like climate change, changing landscape? Have you observed kind of any of those mega trends in your, in your, in your research? Yeah, the easiest trends to notice are those that are um, directly related to warming. There's a lot of um, uh, um, species that, that their migration is signaled by things like snowpack. Uh, you know, the elk, when the, when the snow comes out of the high mountains, they go back up to the high mountains, uh, away, from, excuse me, away from humans. Um, the same is true with migratory birds. Much of their migration is, signals come from, um, from, uh, from the timing of spring warm-ups or fall cool-downs. And so, um, so there, is, there are signals in the data. Um, you can definitely see that uh, the timing of migrations has shifted over the, over the past 10 years. Now, some of these species, we don't have tracking data on for 10 years. Birds, for the most part, we don't. But, um, but even you can see this at the micro scale, year to year <laughs> variation is often um, explained by, by just looking at when things warmed up. And so we can, we can make guesses as to what's going to happen into the future as, um, as the earth continues to warm as it has. OK, thank you so much. Um, we also have a few broader statistics related questions about the modeling process in general, uh, <laughs> which may fall a little more under your wheelhouse. Um, but um, the first question is, when you create a model and then compare it with actual data, if there is something that really doesn't align well with the model estimates, how do you then modify the model to fit, mm -hmm. to fit the data that you've tried to apply to it? Yeah, so um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, the, uh, so one of, one of my... Um, one of the great sadnesses of my career so far is that I don't feel like I've ever been able to really simulate really, really good movement data fit from a model. And the reason for that is that movement process, movement is really, really complex. You know, the, the models I've talked about here are pretty coarse, right? The most complicated one sort of allows for variation across time and space. Uh, but if you think about the way you move, and the same would be true of any animal. You, there's a ton of variation in what you do across the course of a day, or a course of a month, or a course of a year. So, um, so I'm always in the situation where I, I know there is more complicated behavior than I'm able to model. And, um, and so what do you do in that situation? Um, what I try to look for is the most obvious pattern that I haven't captured yet. Um, so, uh, so we started um, some of this modeling with um, motility and potential surface ideas, but that weren't allowed to vary over time at all. And we knew there was huge variation over time, but, um, uh, but we first had to solve the computing problem of how, of how to do this, um, fit this model well. 
And once we, um, you know, so one, once we had solved the general computing problem, we started thinking, okay, how can we make the model more complex in a way that captures the most, um, the most obvious uh, omissions to our model? And so uh, th th this is kind of how we work. We, tr we try as best we can to think of what is the biggest thing that is not captured by our model and add that in. And we keep doing that until one of two things happens. Either the data we have no longer support the complexity of the model. You need a lot of data to drive a really complicated model. So either that will happen, or two, the computing required to fit that model becomes too intensive. And you just, you just can't do it in a reasonable amount of time. And when one of those two things happens, you, you stop and say, OK, this is the best I can do for this year. And then you're always thinking about next year, about what you can do next year. All right, thank you for that insight. Um, the other kind of statistical question that also is kind of also tied into some of the examples you were talking about, about the news we're hearing about coronavirus. Someone was wondering how your statistical methods could be used um, to like human epidemiology to prevent the spread of emerging human diseases. Yeah, so there are experts here on campus on that, that particular topic. Nita Bardi is one. There are, I'm sure, many others who, uh, um, who I won't mention. But um, uh, so I've, I've worked mostly with animals, and I've never really done humans. There are a couple of major differences between human disease and animal disease. And the biggest one is whenever we're sick here, we go to the hospital. And so we, uh, you know, if, if it's a really serious disease, we get really, really good surveillance, and we don't have the patchy surveillance that we had. We also know a ton about human movement data, or human movement. Like, for example, if you think about airline travel, we know how many people traveled between every city in the U.S. last month. That data is all available. So we have a ton of, uh, ton of data on, on movement in the developed world. When you get into the undeveloped world, it gets a, uh, a little bit harder. And one thing people are trying to do is use, uh, work with cell phone companies and use cell phones, uh, not smartphones with GPS data, but just cell phones that are connected to cell towers to help understand human mobility in less developed countries. And so instead of getting the high resolution tracking data we're talking here, you only know which cell tower was, con you know, was used by each cell phone at different times. And so you have a much coarser m scale of movement, and you only have movement data for um, the people who have phones. So if you're in a less developed world, this is where this becomes uh, most, most useful. So, uh, so I, I think there's, there's great possibilities to do the same sorts of things I'm doing here for animals on humans. Um, there, there are some, uh, in some ways, the data are better on humans. And in some ways, it's impossible to do things for humans that we do for animals. Like, I can't randomly select a human and stick a tracker on their neck, <laughs> for example. Um, uh, and, and there may be segments of the population who would even refuse um, you know, a cell phone, um, uh, which might allow me to track them, uh, because they don't want to be tracked. And so, um, so, so there are additional uh, complications with human data. But the same principles apply. But um, uh, the way you might try to stitch data together has to take into account these segments of the population that are harder to survey, harder to um, uh, 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 examine and observe. OK. I am going to remind our audience if you have any other questions that come up while he's talking. Um, our students are still down here ready to, um, to grab cards from you. So please, at any point, feel free to um, keep raising those up. Um, I'm going to uh, build off what you were just talking about um, a little bit um, to ask um, a more general question about um, any other societal consequences or big societal impacting questions that you'd, you'd like to be able to address through your research or think could be very interesting and impactfully addressed through the types of research that you're doing? So, um, so I work mostly with animals. And so, uh, I, so I'm working mostly with ecologists. And so the societal impacts um, of animal behavior on, you know, on human society are in general fairly minor. So, um, so mostly, most of, the, most of the, the, the work I'm doing is tied to, um, uh, you know, the big questions might be more on survival of animal species. So the, the sorts of things that um, our analyses have been used to do are things like, um, you may have driven in places where there are wildlife overpasses 
uh, where, where there's just a big overpass over a highway that just has trees and grass on it. So um, you can imagine fitting a model to movement data and then using that to best place something like that so that when the elk migrate, they're not going to get hit by cars as often. And people have done exactly that using movement studies. So, um, so a, a lot of what it, uh, I, I think, um, how I think we can make the world a better place, or at least what I'm trying to do, is, is help people understand um, the ecology of animals. Um, so in that setting, some of the big questions are, what, what is going to happen under climate change? Um, there are also a lot of just unknown questions. I showed you some migratory bird data. And if we dug a little deeper into that, you would see that most of that data come only from a couple of small studies. So even though there may be birds across the whole US that are migrating up to Canada and back, we may only have tracking data from two specific spatial locations. And, um, and, and uh, so one of the big methodological things I'm trying to do is build methods that can take small sets of data like that and pair them with more population level data. Like for example, someone asked about drones. This data that are stationary in space, um, uh, you know, pairing those two sor sorts of data together has a lot of possibility for really understanding what's happening in an ecological system. So uh, from a methodological perspective, that is a big one, I think. Okay, thanks so much. So we're going to go back from the broad questions to something very specific um, based off what I've been getting here. Um, we had a question about the ant study um, that you talked about and what you were able to deduce, if anything, from the, the ant study in terms of why only certain ants seem to be making the, that journey between the two ah. areas of high density um, population. Yeah, oh, that's a good, what's going on here? You're going the wrong direction. Let's just go back and peek at the ants again just because it's fun. Oh, what's going on here? I'm clicking too many times, I guess. OK, so this is a good question. So um, we've got a whole bunch of ants on the left, a whole bunch of ants on the right, and there's only a couple that go between. Uh, so there's a couple of things to note here. One is that ant societies, and I, I, should, I should let David Hughes answer this question. But I guess I'm wearing the tie today, so I'll answer it. So, and, I'll, and, I'll, and he can correct me later. So, uh, so ants, um, uh, different ants play different roles in the society. And have, um, so for example, one of these ants is the queen ant. And, um, and if she dies, the whole colony dies. So there's a number of ants who essentially are her, her retinue and who just stay right around her. There are other ants that, that leave the nest. These are the foragers. And in fact, most ants become a forager as they age. So the older ants go out and do the most uh, dangerous tasks. And so what we see is that you know, among an ant society, just like in our social society, there's a division of labor, division of duties. And so different ants have, have different duties. And so, for example, if we looked at the ants over on the right-hand side, many of them are ants who do leave the nest. And in fact, we might see that more trophallaxis occurs between those ants than would occur between those ants and ants in the queen retinue. And so what we have are just a few ants that move between these, that connect these locations, or connect these subgroups of ants. And that provides a buffer between the outside world and the dangers, like the ant poison that you might put to kill the ants in your house. It provides a buffer between that and the queen. Because if the queen survives, then the whole colony can survive. And by having sort of a, a set of social layers that are mostly disconnected, that, um, that, that allows for a bit of a buffer between uh, harmful agents and the heart of the column. And while we're on this slide, there's another question that came in that's related to this ant research. Um, in terms of why the clusters of high density um, are at the opposite ends instead of why didn't they move just right next to each other? And would, are they intending, would it eventually separate into separate colonies? Is, is there a reason that uh, you know of for why they're so separate? Yeah, so um, if I showed you the other two colonies, you would see a bit of variation. So two colonies separated exactly like this. And another colony moved out of that back chamber and moved into two kind of close chambers, or two, two chambers close to the right-hand side of the nest. So there's some, um, so I, I think what we really take out of this is that ants can organize themselves spatially in different ways, but maintain a, um, an underlying uh, social structure. And they can do that in multiple sort of spatial configurations. And one of the reasons for that is they can just adjust the, the speed at which they move between them. 
So there are these subgroups, and it doesn't really matter so much where these subgroups are because they're mostly segregated and only um, interfaced by, by a small subset of ants. Okay, thank you. Um, so from the very specific questions, we're gonna zoom out one more time. Um, and so you've already talked about a few um, factors that are limitations to the research, such as um, GPS tracking technology, what's available there, um, in the limits of what you can do in certain modeling, uh, modeling situations. Are there any other major impediments that you feel like you, you, you would need to overcome or could overcome eventually to advance this type of research? And is it a matter of having a larger budget or are there other just kind of things that haven't been developed yet that, that would need to move forward for this research to advance? Yeah, okay, so here's a couple of things. So um, I've shown you data from, um, mostly from terrestrial animals. Uh, our ants were a special case where we could video them. Um, so GPS technology works really well for terrestrial animals, um, but fails for, um, uh, for marine mammals or marine animals and also for uh, an, you know, subterranean animals. So if we wanted to study bats, we would completely lose GPS tracking when they go into their caves. If we wanted to study sea lions or seals, GPS data are completely worthless. Um, and the, you know, they, they have other satellite-based systems, but, um, but the technology is, is such that you know, if a seal is just under a meter of water, which being a seal, it likes to do a lot, um, you can get location data that can be off by 100 kilometers or more. So, um, so tracking technology underwater and, um, and underground is something that um, uh, makes it very difficult to study some species. So um, GPS data is great because the, the accuracy of it is so, so, so good. Um, you know, GPS uh, error is about 10 to 20 meters. So that's why your phone can pretty much snap you to which road you're on when you're driving through town, right? Um, uh, and, and so when we have data that are that good, it, you know, we, we don't really need much more. But uh, for, for a lot of other systems, like marine systems, we just can't get that. All right, thanks so much. Um, and we had an interesting, um, another kind of hypothetical question about a certain <coughs> species and disease, um, whether you've considered um, studying it or not. Um, have you considered working on chronic wasting disease on white-tailed uh. deer? And I think a follow-up question to that could be interesting is um, how, do, how do researchers just, you know, make those choices about this is something that would be you know, something that we could study using our models when there's probably many potential candidates for both animal systems and potential diseases? Yeah, okay, so two questions there. One, the specific one on CWD. Um, I am working on CWD uh, with some folks in Wisconsin. I have in the past with folks in um, Colorado. And so CWD is... Um, uh, chronic wasting disease is a disease that, that makes deer and um, other, other similar species look um, kind of mangy. And so you can imagine as a hunter, you know, here in Pennsylvania, game hunting is huge, right? And, uh, and CWD is beginning, you know, has been seen in Pennsylvania and is spreading in many states in the West right now. And so it's, a, um, it's another one of these diseases that is spreading perhaps slowly enough that we might be able to do something about it. It's faster than um, bruce brucellosis that we were looking at in the elk, but, um, uh, but it's taken a decade or so to work its way across the U.S., and it, and it isn't everywhere yet. Um, so, yeah, so we are working on um, doing very similar kinds of models um, for chronic wasting disease. So that was the specific question. Now, can you remind me, there was a more general question. So I guess and there's it. many choices for different oh. animal systems, different yeah. diseases um, to study. How, how do researchers make those choices about what to, you know, what, which system to approach first based off, um, yeah. I guess, what's the data that's available? So, um, uh, so here's an answer you probably weren't expecting, but um, some of the, some of, um, you know, a lot of things in this life are determined by who you know. And, um, and I really like working with, uh, with, with people who I can talk to one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, uh, so, you know, I, the, uh, David Hughes, who, who's the ant man, right? Zombie ant guy. He's in the office next to mine. And I really like that. We've tried to work out a tap code where it could be like, you know, the ants are on the move or something. No, we haven't really looked at that. But, but um, so, so some of it is honestly just who you know, and I really, 
I really like working with people who I can sit down and have a chat with. That's more fun than talking to somebody over Skype. So that's, that's perhaps not the best scientific reason, right? So um, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I take that back. There's, it's easier to do science when you're, when you're in person than it is remote. It is easier to collaborate with somebody and work together with somebody. Um, so how do we choose what we work on? So one, we, we're looking for um, uh, important questions. Two, we're looking, as a quantitative scientist, I'm, I'm looking for questions uh, and systems where there are data that I can use to help answer questions. In particular, I'm often looking for systems where, um, you know, somebody once told me, oh, are they still developing new statistics? <laughs> and, and I can understand where that thought process might come from, but, um, but, but I'm often looking for systems that are important, that matter, that there's a scientist that cares about them, where the methods that have been used are, um, are methods that have been stale or, or constant for a decade or two, even though our ability to collect data and the kinds of data we can collect has changed dramatically. And so in those situations, we can often do a lot better than we could in the past because we have so much more data. But the data collection um, tends to uh, progress faster than the methods for analyzing that data. So I'm often looking for, for situations where we have a lot of data, new data, that, um, that, that good statistical methods have not been developed for that specific case.